stick too cheery for this segment on my channel. I feel like this outfit says 90s children's TV presenter, but my soul says jaded comedian with an axe to grind. Even making this list was painful, so you know, get yourself your beverage of choice and your favourite salty snack. This is time to talk about my worst books of 2020. If 2020 needed any more worst bits. Hi guys, it's Leanne and I've been putting off making this video because I'm gonna sound like a bitch. But you know what, I'm fine with that as my legacy and we like opinions on this channel. Some semi good news is this list is only 8 books long and I feel like for 2020 that's a very conservative list. Now before we delve into the depths of the salt mine, I first want to briefly address a discourse which has once again floated its way to the top of the scum pile. And that of course is the idea that worst books videos and in fact negative reviews in general are A not necessary, B not valid and C just pure mean. I have been on booktube for six years now and every single year there are some facets of this conversation which happen again and again and I am over it. First of all, reviews are not for the author. They are for readers of the book. They are fundamentally how other readers find books that they are interested in reading. I am an illustrator and I put art out into the world and I absolutely know that every time I put out a piece of art for every five people who go, oh my god, that's amazing, I love that, there are another five people who are like, oh, that is totally not my aesthetic, that is, no, I do not like that. If I broke my heart over those five people who didn't like my art every time, I would never make another piece of art. When an author writes a book and goes through the process of getting an agent and then finding a publisher and going through the entire publication process, of course they are deeply emotionally involved in that piece of art which they have lovingly created and put out into the universe. But in purchasing that book and choosing to buy that book, you have already supported them in their dream and their journey. If you then subsequently do not like that book or even think that book is terrible, that is perfectly acceptable. You are entitled to your opinion. You are entitled to tell people your opinion. And as I have consistently said every year on this channel, it is perfectly acceptable to bring constructive criticism to the table even if that is very strong constructive criticism as some of my criticisms of these books will be it is perfectly acceptable to do that just don't be a dick i saw a lot of conversation this time around about tagging authors in these worst books videos and in worst books wrap-ups on bookstagram or twitter and absolutely that is unacceptable that would be like every time somebody saw a piece of my art them taking time out of their day to walk over to me and say your art is terrible and then to walk away again. We as book lovers understand that authors want us to love their books and that publishers want us to love their books and we want to love their books. Nobody drops £20 on a brand new published hardback book just to hate read it. Nobody sane spends all of their available income filling their library with books that they just want to hate read. Books, just as any other form of art, are subjective. Negative reviews are not gatekeeping and they are not joy policing. So please, if you are one of the people out there who thinks that worst book videos are mean, stop watching them. Go watch people's best book videos and support those authors there. But if you are like me, one of those people who likes to watch worst books videos, not just to see the flip side of people's opinions, but also because sometimes I actually find books in there that really haven't worked for somebody else because they have all of the facets of a book that would work for me, then stick around because you might find a gem or two in here. Now that I have done my public service announcement, I should check for passionate lipstick on my teeth. Now, much like my best books of 2020, I have not ranked this list except for the book which is my worst book of the year. That is definitely in the number one trashiest slot and everything else just falls somewhere underneath it. So I'm just going to go in the order that I wrote them down, which I don't even think is the order that I read them in. It's some subjective order made up with my brain. You're welcome. The first book on this list I am going to mention only briefly because I spoke about it 
a lot in 2020 and that's because it took me so freaking long to get through it. That book of course is The Murders at White House Farm by Carol Ann Lee. This is a true crime account of Jeremy Bamber's slaughter of his entire family in the 1980s. This book does two things that I really really hate about true crime novels. The first is the actual format of the book. While it is perfectly readable and I actually really like Carol Ann Lee's prose, she chose to begin the book by going back not to Jeremy Bamber's parents' generation but to their parents' generation which is a generation which never appears in any of the narrative and it was as a way to give like the nature nurture argument of a lot of true crime which focuses on the perpetrators. It might have been a more effective way to try and point out that the Bamber family before Jeremy and his sister were adopted was already a kind of really uncomfortable place to be but instead by putting it all at the beginning we weren't invested and we didn't know why we cared and so I didn't. And the second thing that this book did is a thing that I have talked about many 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 times in relation to true crime and that is that although this book did look at the victims lives much more broadly than a lot of true crime that I have read, it very very much focused on Bamber and his motivations and why he did the things that he did and because the author was in correspondence with him there was a lot of back and forth about what he had told her to put in the book and the way that he was still trying to pull strings to get her to edit things in her publication and unfortunately although she was trying to use it to illustrate the way in which she was not going to let him shape the narrative it unfortunately gave him quite a lot of airtime on the page and so he did successfully shape the narrative. The rest of this list is kind of thrillery focused but before we jump into that mess I first want to mention another book just very briefly and that is Break Your Glass Slippers by Amanda Lovelace. This is a poetry collection which is loosely related to the Women Are Some Kind of Magic poetry series that she did. This poetry collection I think falls victim to that thing that happens sometimes where it's like style over substance. The poems in this were universally quite short, they were quite sort of staccato and they were formatted really weirdly on the page so that the poems didn't take up very much room at all and it was a really weird choice for this one. If it had been done in the previous collection I could have understood it because it would have been sort of like a metaphor for the way that women have traditionally not taken up a lot of space on like the page of life but this one is kind of trying to promote you to feel good about yourself. It's more like affirmations than it is poems which delve into like past experiences and I've seen a lot of moaning about Amanda Lovelace's poetry and poetry like that like Milk and Honey in general where people are calling it Instagram poetry as if that is somehow like lesser or as if short form poems that are more to the point and less lyrical are somehow worthless and I think that entire argument is just a really shit take. But I did feel like a lot of the poems in this one felt kind of like offhand. There wasn't a lot of depth to them. They were very surface. I think this collection might be good for uh, teen girls if they are people who are new to the idea of valuing themselves. But for me I got very little from it and it actually kind of put a bad taste in my mouth because it came on the heels of checking out another one of Amanda's collections which really also didn't work for me so I think I'm going to give her work a break for a little while. Right so delving into the mystery thriller portion of this list which most of the rest of it is let's be perfectly honest. This is Anything You Do Say by Gillian McAllister and it is a sliding doors thriller. I had quite a few issues with this one involving things that I have issues with in a lot of other thrillers. Like there were a lot of really poor and unexplained choices made by the protagonist in both versions of the choice that she made and unfortunately they were kind of explained away in the narrative by like oh she's a bit scatterbrained and she never really follows through on anything and she procrastinates about everything in her life but unfortunately we knew nothing about the character beforehand and not enough of her afterwards in any other scenario for us to actually see that proved through in her life and so we're just told constantly that that's what she's like. Also in both versions of the sliding door scenario her relationship breaks down and in both versions I didn't even buy that they were a couple in the first place. This is one of those where if it was just like billed as a domestic thriller if there was more about the relationship in it 
I would have been sitting here being like this is another domestic thriller about people who fundamentally don't like each other and I don't believe that they would have been together in the first place. Again I feel like there wasn't enough of their relationship on the page when they actually liked each other and so when they didn't like each other I was like cool okay you don't like each other just break up. And then finally the thing that's really really bugged me about this one since I read it and in fact more and more when I think about it is the way that the protagonist continually promotes the idea that if she is not a mother or she's not able to have children then she is worth less. It's the way that motherhood is held up to be this like one ideal that all women should strive for and while I understand that some women do feel that way I feel like the protagonist portrayed it very much as a thing that's like it's a universally accepted concept and we all feel that way and I felt like it was really damaging. I've spoken to a few people who have both really liked and also been a bit eh about Gillian McAllister's books and this like theme of motherhood is apparently something that pops up in quite a few of her books so I'm a little bit trepidatious to try another one. This next one is one that I definitely think I have an unpopular opinion on because if I look on my Goodreads predominantly it is five and four stars. This is of course when no one is watching by Alyssa Cole. First of all the plot of this one is very very close and by very very close I mean identical to a movie that came out really recently which was dealing with black people disappearing. It was a horror thriller and it was set in a white neighbourhood and that's all she's going to say about that because if you haven't seen the movie that I'm talking about you might still really like the book because it won't be a complete repeat for you but it was a complete repeat for me. I knew exactly where it was going from page one. There was no twist, it was just a retelling of that very popular movie and I felt really really ripped off by it. Not because I need every thriller that I read to be this like new experience but because if you're gonna retell something at least change up some elements of it so that I feel like I'm in a new scenario and I did not at all in this one. And the second part of this was I loved Sydney in the beginning of this. She was like this strong independent woman who was determined that she was going to like crack open this mystery of her community. She gets involved with a guy from the neighbourhood. The book then shifts gear and becomes a romance book. It becomes very much about Sydney and her relationship with this guy and all of the plot points just like sort of fell into the background. That wasn't what I signed up for. I've since discovered that Alyssa Cole is actually a romance writer by trade, like that's that's primarily what she does and this is her first thriller and I think if I had known that going in I would have been less surprised with where this went and maybe my expectations could have been adjusted a little bit but as it was I just felt really cheated by it and I just didn't believe the relationship. Okay so the next three books that I'm going to talk about are thrillers and one of them is in fact my worst book of the year. I'm going to talk about them all individually because they all had other issues other than this one thing but they all had this one really terrible thing tying them together. This one overarching horrible theme which ties the three of them together and that was the way that they represented bodily difference and bodily disfigurement. So the first book that I'm going to talk about is Bliss House by Laura Benedict. I picked this up in my month of picking up only spooky books and predominantly I was picking up only haunted house books. So the premise was amazing but it turned out that the reason the mother was taking her daughter back to this house was because there had been a horrible fire, there had been an explosion in their old house which had killed her husband and which had left her daughter with really, really terribly painful scars. And the way that these scars were introduced onto the page, I, I, I shit you not guys, was that her daughter had like a hood or something over her head and she turned around to the contractor who was there and he had this like <gasps> Oh, moment when he looked at her face and every single character who gets introduced to her and sees her face throughout this whole book has the exact same reaction. They have this horror reaction which eventually gets to this like oh okay I can look at it now reaction which then turns into oh you poor thing what a shame your life has been wasted by this. Like every other aspect of her daughter's character then meant nothing because she had a physical disfigurement and it was so insidious. There were so many mentions of the way that she could have had a bright future but she now wasn't going to have one. Of the way that men would never look at her again. There are two other things in this book 
which have to do with romance that I'm not going to go into too much because really they honestly made me feel ill. But one of them involves a boy her own age noticing her and seeing her despite her disfigurements. And the author presents him to you like he deserves some kind of merit award for finding her attractive despite the fact that she has a physical difference. But the last thing about this that really, really made me so angry was that one of the effects of the house was that it was making her better. So she walked with a cane at the beginning of the novel and as she spent more and more time in the house, she needed the cane less and less and her mother kept commenting on how this was a good thing instead of seeing the obviously like vacant look in her eyes as she was being like possessed by ghosts. It was just so bad. Yeah, this is one of those books that I just wholesale would not recommend. It's not even a like it didn't work for me. It's a, I actually think it's harmful and I wouldn't ever put it into anybody's hands on purpose. Speaking of books that are just really really harmful, I have a book that I just don't understand the popularity of. This book was massive at the start of 2020, like it was huge, so many people were reading it. The book that I'm talking about is of course The Silent Patient by Alex Michaelides and I just... For a start, this is another one that has a completely misleading premise because this straight, white, middle-aged, conventionally attractive man who is a psychiatrist does not get handed this case. He actually tracks this woman down. He deliberately goes out to work at a facility that this woman is at and then he insinuates himself into her care. And from that very moment, he describes her as being actually beautiful underneath all of the greasy hair as being attractive and captivating that he can see it shining through this weird sort of patient sickly attire that she has. I cannot tell you how much that turned my stomach. There was just so much, so very much wrong with his relationship with her. But then as I've touched on, he does value her above all other women in the book because there are other women in the book who are <laughs> done so dirty. There's one particular patient that he describes as being fat and greasy and just horrific to look at. He presents her as such a horrifically horrible person who smells and is dirty and yet she's in the exact same position as this woman who he finds radiant and beautiful. And that's without going into the weird sort of plot holes in this which is that nobody was really reviewing his patient care which was that he was allowed to somehow be alone with this extremely violent offender, alone with a very vulnerable woman in a room with no CCTV, that he was able to sneak about the facility and there was no CCTV picking him up in the corridors. This book very clearly tells you that it has an unreliable narrator in the blurb in the beginning and I haven't spoiled anything in this book at all and despite the fact that this narrator is meant to be unreliable I could not get away from the fact that this is so clearly the views of the author. Like the same phrases and the exact same way of seeing things was repeated over and over and over again and it was so clearly the author on the page. So many people on my Goodreads though have read this, like so many of you have read this and have rated it really highly and I just, I don't understand. I don't understand guys. Please explain it to me. And finally in this category of body shaming horrendousness I have so much to say about this one that I'm not even going to beat about the bush with it. This is The Sculptress by Minette Walters and it is literally one of the most disgusting books that I have ever read. And when I say read I mean DNF'd and when I say DNF'd I mean it's one of the very few books in my life that I have actually put straight in the bin because I don't want anybody else to read it. It's so damaging, it's so damaging. It just, it boggles me that it got printed in the first place. So this is essentially about the sculptress who is a woman who has again killed her entire family. And at the beginning of this novel, a journalist has been given time to talk to her about what she's done. From the very first page, I mean the very first page, this woman is talked about in the most disgusting way. I'm actually going to trigger warning this part because 
I find that the language used to describe this character is so damaging that I don't want to accidentally trigger anybody. So if you are at all sensitive to this or you don't want to hear it for any reason just skip to the part where this book is off the screen. So the journalist is sitting waiting in the interview room waiting for the patient to be brought to her and as soon as she spots her that is when it starts. She is described as being so fat that she is gargantuan, that she is hideous, that she has folds of flesh which are bursting through her garments and disgusting, her uh, fingers are fat, everything is rubbing together in an audible way, she can hear it because she's so fat. It talks about the way that her feet are pointing in different directions because her thighs are so fat and this is the word that continues to be repeated over and over and over again are pushing her feet in opposite directions so that she can only shuffle, she can't properly walk. It talks about uh, the wheezing, it talks about her folds again and again. And then on the very next, this is the third page guys, on the third page it talks about the journalist knowing about an incident which had happened and she's relating it to you like it's a funny thing, like it's a ha ha, oh my god can you believe this? Where this woman got stuck in one of the toilet seats in the facility because literally her fat got sucked through somehow the toilet seat and then she had to get guards to leverage her up and it was like attached to her like in some kind of comedy movie and she presents this to you like ha ha it's so funny oh my god can you believe this and I just couldn't believe what I was reading on the page I actually I couldn't I, I took the book away and I read it out to so many people and I'm like is this just me and every single person that I read the beginning of that too was like are you serious? Is that a published book? That is not only a published book, this is an anniversary edition of this book. And I don't care how good the thriller is. I don't care how good the twist is. I don't, I really, I, I, I cannot describe to you how little I care about the plot after a character is described like that. So yeah, I don't think I need to tell you that I don't think that you should pick this up. But just in case I've somehow made myself unclear, I don't think you should pick this up. I think it's a terrible novel. There are so many other novels which deal with women in asylums or which deal with women who have killed for seemingly inexplicable reasons. You can find lots of them, just don't, don't, don't choose this one. But you will notice that I have kept one book for the end of this list and that is for a little bit of light relief because I figured ending on that one might be a bit like well, so I have kept back a romance novella and I would like to complain to management about this novella because it was so disappointing. This is about two women who meet in the course of their jobs. One of them, Katie, is like 28, conventionally pretty, very feminine, has just met the man of her dreams and doesn't ever, ever, ever think that she could find another woman attractive and then she meets Cassidy who's literally described in the blurb as assertive and sexually promiscuous. Like either of those things are unusual or bad things. And that's without even touching on this idea of sexual promiscuity and how many partners are too many partners and when other people get an opinion to say that about you and your body. For such a short novella we touched on so very many stereotypes, like so very many stereotypes. I just feel like Camille Perry had like a sapphic bingo board and she was sitting there like I am going to get a full house with all of these weird tropes. Cassidy dresses primarily like a man. Cassidy shows her assertiveness and her confidence by being rude to people. She's abrasive and unpleasant and in a few occasions she's actually downright out of order and yet all of these things are things that are very attractive to Katie because she is slight and feminine and she wants to be looked after. And essentially Cassidy represents all of the daddy issues that Katie has ever had in her entire life. <laughs> There's also this really awful revolution moment where like Katie realises that Cassidy wears men's underwear and she's like gas! Like this is some kind of weird thing that she's never encountered before and yet somehow it's so incredibly sexy because Cassidy does it. It was just, it was, it was a bad time. It was a bad time and there are so many other female female novellas that you can like search out and it was, just, just don't do it. 
just don't do it. So that was my salty list of saltiness for 2020. Did you enjoy it? Did I trash any of your favourites? I'm really sorry if I did. But at the same time, completely not sorry because this is how I feel. Please do feel free to tell me how you feel in the comments, however. Are any of the books on this list genuinely your favourites? Do you disagree with me? I like opinions. Please tell me yours. Please also tell me your top worst book of 2020. I have to hear it. I have to hear it. I'm emotionally invested in it. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing for more of me and my endless, endless opinions. And I will see you guys very soon for some book gushing when I haul things all over the place. Just haul things everywhere. So many piles on my floor. So many. Okay. Goodbye! <coughs> I actually twice in this video almost gave myself an asthma attack while I was ranting. So believe me when I say that I do this for you.